Hey everyone, Sleepy Reader here. Um, I'm going to do some comic book thoughts on the 15 comic books I got this week. And I'm going to, like I did last week, I'm going to rank them. So start with number 15 and go down to number one. I think there's 15. Hopefully I have that numbering right. And before I do that, I thought I'd just show you a little bit of a haul. Um, some odds and ends I got this week including a, uh, which call it, an in-stock trades little haul I got. And the big thing I got from that is this Milton Kniff visual biography. And um, it, in, the in the current camera setup, I don't think I can even show you this much without knocking stuff down, but it's almost entirely uh, illustrations and um, other odds and ends from throughout Milton Kniff's career with just a little bit of text. So it, it really is mostly a visual biography from all the stages of his life. And it's a beautiful book. And I don't think it cost me that much. Um, hopefully I can find time to do a video about this book by itself. But I thought I'd mention that. Um, I'm really happy with this purchase from in stock trades, and this was just part of what I got from in stock trades. <clears throat> I also got um, Marvel Horror, the magazine collection, which has some random bits, perhaps the best bits, but I'm not sure if they really are, um, from all the Marvel black and white horror magazines of the 70s. Uh, and uh, to tell you the truth, I think it's better to get the actual magazines. And uh, this thing, I didn't, I wasn't paying close attention when I got it, or I guess I thought it would be a much bigger collection, or maybe I even thought it, I was getting a hardback. But this has a list price of $35, $45 if you're in Canada. And it's, it's pretty slender, it's black and white. Um, a lot of these magazines you could probably get for five or six dollars, um, at least readers copies. So <clears throat> anyway, um, I don't know if they're going to have some omnibuses and things like that come out. Um, I mean, I'm still going to happily read these, but and I, I may own some of the magazines these are in, but I think I was expecting a lot more. I can't remember now when I actually ordered this was over a week ago, what I thought I was getting here. Um, but when I look at the price, and uh, with whatever discounts I managed to get, this cost me $20. So $20 instead of $35. It's still it's not a whole lot for, for that much money. Um, <clears throat> much more worth the money is this Batman Detective Comics. I just got these in-stock trades stuff today, so I haven't looked at them a lot, but just flipping through this um, hardback deluxe edition, 80 Years of Batman in Detective Comics. Uh, it's a really wonderful book. Its only flaw is it is glued, glued binding. Um, but I can work with that, <clears throat> especially in such a great book. It has both Batman stories and um, other stories that appeared in Detective over the years, such as this one, Pow Wow Smith. Uh, and has essays scattered throughout and uh, yeah, just all kinds of awesome stuff from all the ages of Batman going all the way up. <laughs> it's funny, they, they reprint a couple things from Detective Comics 27, <coughs> which was the number seven in the renum 27 in the renumbered um, the renumbered new 52. Uh, which was a special sized issue with a bunch of stuff. So they have two, they have the Brian Hitch story in here, and they have the Scott Snyder, Sean uh, Murphy story in here. Anyway, this this thing is is just a great for me a great item. I really love it. Can't wait to find time to sit down and read all of it. And uh, where's the price? I don't see the price, but I'm pretty sure it was not much more than that paperback from Marvel. It was less, $30 list price. So this beautiful hardback 
is less than that black and white heart, uh, paperback from Marvel. <clears throat> you know, while I'm yakking about prices, let me look. Yeah, and this incredible book, uh, this incredible book, the Kniff book, which is gigantic and of super high quality, was 50 bucks list price. And I'm sure I paid quite a bit less. <clears throat> and then um, I've been perusing a number of used bookstores recently. And so I thought I'd show you the kind of uh, pulpy paperback covers that are, are attracting me right now. I got this Robert Silverberg book up the line. It is kind of damaged there and it's got some writing on it. But anyway, also, I really want to read this one. I have read a lot of Robert Silverberg, but he's written so much. I never read up the line. <clears throat> so, um, and then this one, classic sort of by John W. Campbell. He's class. He's, he was a classic. Um, what's the right word? <clears throat> space opera exploding things in space kind of author. Here, let me zoom in a little bit. Uh, before he became the most famous editor in all of science fiction. So this, I presume, is some of his work from the 30s before he became the editor of Astounding, the architect of the golden age of science fiction. But also just a fun cover. Even if this weren't uh, John W. Campbell, I probably would have picked it up. And here we have um, Andre Norton, Crossroads of Time. Uh, I haven't read nearly as much Andre Norton as I should. Um, she's very famous for her Witch World series, but she was one of the most popular uh, young adult science fiction writers of the 50s and 60s, I think. And I don't know if this was originally a young adult book or not. Um, a Chase Through Alternate Worlds, something we're all too familiar with in comics with their multiverses right now. And another Andre Norton, I love this cover, is called The Last Planet. <clears throat> Complete and unabridged, in case you were worried. I guess they, there might have been uh, stories that were abridged to fit in cheaper paperbacks after coming out in hardback. I don't know. <clears throat> but I love the design of this cover. It's got the kind of picture window that reminds me of those 1971 Marvels. And um, I like the kind of design elements of under her name and by the side of the of the planet and just the color blue there and everything in this painting it's so i don't know so on the spot for this kind of science fiction novel and then uh more in the edgar rice burroughs vein <clears throat> i couldn't resist when i found an okay copy of the mucker which i remember loving as a kid um, it's about some kind of uneducated, mindless guy who goes on a series of adventures and maybe eventually develops his brain, if I'm remembering correctly, and at the end becomes sophisticated and suave. <coughs> um, I don't know if it involves pirates or what, what have you, but unlike most of Edgar Rice Burroughs' books, it's not a fantasy in, in the sense of on another planet or um, wild fantasy things happening, as far as I remember. Anyway, and a, an amazing cover by Frank Frazetta. Um, so that was, that was hard to resist. And I love these older paperbacks. Again, a lot of the stuff I love is from Ace Books. Um, this is Escape on Venus, which I probably read as a kid, but with a different cover. This is slightly before the time when I would have been collecting them. Complete and unabridged, it says again. And this covers by Roy Krengel, who was kind of the mentor to Frank Frazetta in getting him into painting uh, pulpy, pulpy paperback book covers. Um, although obviously their styles are quite a bit different. <clears throat> and finally, a, a double, I, 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 whenever I find an ace double, or almost always, I grab it. So this one on one side is a Keith Ballmer uh, book called No Man's World. And I'm not too familiar with the author Keith Ballmer, although I think he was a popular author in the 60s particularly. 
and <clears throat> a great author, a kind of classic of science fiction, Poole Anderson. I admire a lot of his work, although I have not read all of it. He wrote a lot. And this one, this one is another favorite cover of mine. I just love the layout of it and the guy is doing kind of graffiti out in space or something. Mayday Orbit. And um, this one stars, I know, one of his ongoing characters who I've never read about, Captain Sir Dominic Flandry. And I think I, I used to really avoid military science fiction. And I think that he, or I always assumed he was a military science fiction character. So I've never read any of the Flandry books, but I'll give, I'll give it a try now. So, um, well, quickly, I also got a few back issues from my comic book store, as I often do, just looking through their back issue, um, <clears throat> the, their new back issues, and I can. So this obviously is Captain America from the very early 70s, uh, 100 and Captain America 127. This run of Captain America starts at C Captain America 100. Um, and this issue is interesting because it is Gene Colan art on the inside inked by Wally Wood. And I didn't realize Wally Wood had ever inked Gene Colan. Those seem like two very different artists indeed. And then I got this Captain America annual. Or is it an annual? It says special, but it's listed as an annual in my CLZ app. It's got... On the inside, it's got older Captain America stories that were laid out by Jack Kirby and penciled by George Tuska. Um, George Tuska is not one of my favorites, um, but still, uh, and I love this cover. Another picture window there. So that was worth getting for me. <clears throat> and this Avengers cover is pretty darn awesome. I'm not sure who drew it. Is that John Buscema or is that someone else? Inside, I believe, is um, Barry Windsor Smith. I think he did three issues of The Avengers at this time. So I'm looking forward to reading that. And last but not least, Avengers number 82, with which a cover that I'm not quite sure if this is Sal Buscema or John Buscema, out of a glance. Um, bits of it look like Sal and bits of it look like John to me. Funny. <clears throat> I guess, well, they never give art credit, but I should see who's on the inside here. <clears throat> they never give credit for who did the cover back in the day. The John Buscema did the interior, so maybe it's a John Buscema cover. I almost wonder if it was somewhat redrawn by someone else or something. Something's off about it to me. Like particularly that figure there and that one there, they just don't quite look like how John Buscema would draw them to me. <clears throat> Okay, phew, I'm getting hot in my hat. Uh, on to the countdown. So, <clears throat> overall, it was a, uh, a, good, a very good week. 15 comics. I decided I want, I'm going on a trip. I don't want to bring the comics with me, so I want to finish reading them quickly. 15 comics were hard for me to read in a three-day period, to tell you the truth. And I think I read about... I don't know, six or seven or eight of them today. <clears throat> and I realize I like to read a comic and then I kind of want to rest. I can read a, two or three comics and then I want to kind of rest my brain because with each comic, you're switching. So it was a bit of an intense read for me. Um, so I think that's why like uh, eight or not, well, maybe up to 10 comics during the week is probably a better number for me. But anyway, um, number 15 was Guardians of the Galaxy um, by Donny Cates and Jeff Shaw. I think I would have thought that I would have liked this more. Um, I'm manually focusing the camera. So <coughs> just a bunch of stuff happened here. I guess my... My theory that Star Fox is the one who has Thanos in his mind was probably disproved here. 
And other than that, it was a bunch of kind of random scenes where people find people and they fight with the people and they say things to them. <laughs> so it was okay. I mean, I, I didn't hate it at all. Um, I enjoyed reading it. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'm not taking Guardians of the Galaxy off my pull list anytime soon. But it was, of, of this week's, my least favorite. <clears throat> Next was Incursion, which I had slightly higher hopes for. Part of the problem here, this is uh, a kind of about the, the geomancer of Earth in the Valiant Universe and the uh, immortal warrior who always protects the geomancer. And in this book, the warrior had to go into the realms of death, which was just kind of one hellish, disgusting thing after another. Maybe I just wasn't in the mood for it. And maybe the art didn't always make things completely clear what was going on. Um, but a lot of people got a lot of body parts hacked off. Um, and I just wasn't that into it. <clears throat> Dark Red <clears throat> was, a, was a good comic. All the comics from here on in I liked. I think... I think my the reason why Dark Red's kind of low here at number uh, 13 is partially the art and color didn't do much for me, and partially the story just kind of, it had moments where it kind of sagged a bit, and I don't know. And, and maybe it's also the, the uh, stories about vampires all feel kind of familiar, even though this is kind of kind of your redneck vampire he has this odd relationship with this girl who has a disease where she has too much blood in her body i don't know if that's a real disease or not that i thought that was kind of clever if it is a real disease but yeah i'm looking at it again and i really do not like the coloring so um that was probably the coloring and and the art were probably the big reasons why i didn't get into this as much as i thought i would i really hate that cover actually <laughs> <clears throat> okay, this this was the biggest surprise in a negative sense. I mean, it's number uh, 12, and, and I liked it, um, but I wasn't as wowed by it as I thought. It's the new Dark Horse comic, a burger book from G. Willow Wilson with art and color by um, Christian Ward. And I usually love Christian Ward's art. It was pretty good here, although it didn't wow me as much as I thought I, it would. And the writing didn't definitely did not wow me as much as I thought it would. Um, I even heard someone say this is going to be like the next saga. But in the first issue of Saga, <clears throat> I really knew who the characters were and I really knew what the conflict was. Here the characters all seem a bit vaguer. The conflict seems to be about some monetary bookkeeping thing that some somebody who's known to be greed, some greedy corporation is doing something and it's going to suck in this uh, religious cult along with sucking in uh, some people working on spaceships, I guess. It's fun enough. I'm certainly not dropping it. And the art was quite cool. Um, I don't know why I expected it to wow me even more than it did, but there you are. I think the expectations still with Christian Ward come to me from his incredible work <coughs> on Odyssey or ODYC that he did with Matt Fraction. So it's a good comic. If you like sci-fi, it's probably worth keeping an eye on. Maybe wait for trade, see if it, see where it goes. Sparrowhawk. <clears throat> coming in at number 11 uh, was a very respectful, <coughs> respectable end to a series that I really enjoyed a lot. But the end was a little weaker than I would have thought from all the other issues. And part of it was um, the art when we got back to the real world, so to speak, when our heroine went back to the real world to face the um, fairy queen who'd taken her place, uh, became much less rich than it had been 
throughout when we were in the land of fairy and maybe that's on purpose or something the land of fairy is more intense but it it just it lowered the impact of the end for me you can see when we're in the land of fairy there's an example on the on the splash page how intense the artwork was and such but uh, we quickly go back spend most of the rest of this issue in <coughs> the land of fairy and there's a a twist at the end of the book <coughs> which was good but not great i almost <coughs> it's my asthma kicking up i almost wish this book did not have a twist at the end um, or a kind of twist that makes the story circular even though that seems like the inevitable thing you ought to do with this kind of story Still, for people who are intrigued by this, I think it'll still be a great read in trade. The first four issues were stronger than the fifth issue, but altogether it's one story. I think that it'll still be a very satisfying read. <coughs> Since I never do any edits, you have to hear me cough. So Middle West came in at number 10. Another, it was a very good issue has certain similarities thematically to Sparrowhawk, but um, it's going for a much longer serial story, I think. So in this episode, <clears throat> uh, there's a lot of moving the, moving the plot along uh, to the next stage in the story, which is our hero um, basically joining the carnival and becoming an employee of that in hopes of eventually uh, getting rid of the sort of storm curse that's inside of him. The thing that I kept noticing here, let's see, a lot of times faces, if they were somewhat small, were left blank. Um, and there's one with just a hint of a mouth. So there's a lot of, um, a lot of blank faces in this issue. <laughs> oh, there's another one right here. Um, I just started noticing that everywhere and I, you know, it's fair enough. You don't always need to put the faces in, but I wonder what that's like, uh, digitally, um, where you're tend to be zoomed into the panels, but anyway, as always amazing art, fun story, inventive, um, amazing, amazing colors. So yeah. Not a lot to say. The story continues. I'm enjoying it a lot. So what did I say? That was number 10. So this must be number nine. Damage is as it probably is heading. I think maybe next issue might be its net last issue. Um, last few issues have been very strong. The writing seems better. Um, it's by written by Air, uh, Vendetti. But these are the artist's first thing, so Lopresti, Aaron Lopresti gets most of the credit. Um, so I don't know how much of the plotting he has done. But ever since Lopresti came on this book, it's gotten a lot better. And it feels like Lopresti, if he's the one who's giving it such a good pace, has gotten better as he's gone along, too. Or maybe he and Vendetti have been working together better. So... It was a lot of a lot of fun here on this monster island with Congo Bill, who it turns out he does turn into a giant ape, I think at will, maybe by doing something to his ring or something like that. Well, I don't think we see him turn into a giant ape in this issue. But <clears throat> anyhow, uh, if you enjoy uh, lots of monsters, this was a good issue. And I certainly enjoyed it. And look at those colors. Those are those are really nice, too. What did I say? That was number nine. So this must be number eight. Exo Man of War. Uh, really like the art here. This is... I don't quite know how it work, works out this way, but, but our hero is reunited with the woman who was his lover on the alien planet. Apparently she's been given some armor like Exo Man of War's armor, which 
he, no one on that planet had anything like that when he was there. So I'm not sure what the story is behind that. And so now she's come <clears throat> sent to save him, kind of, and to make sure that his armor is not brought back to her planet. And so they're both battling all these um, bounty hunters who are trying to kill them to steal the armor. I'm a little fuzzy on all the hows and whys of things, but it was a fun read and really fun artwork. I think this is wrapping up in a few months in the, the not the plots have been all over the place. So I don't know if there's been one plot during Matt Kent's run on it, but Matt Kent's run, I think is wrapping up and they're going to reboot Exo Man of War in June or July. So I'll definitely stick with it until Matt Kent's done. I'm not sure if I'll continue after that. <clears throat> so in at number seven, I think there must have been 16 books. So in at number eight, <laughs> more no editing uh, grooviness here. Um, so in at number eight was Spider-Man Life Story, the 60s. And I have to admit, it was a good story, but I was fighting against it all, all along. And it, it wasn't what I wanted it to be. I wanted it to fit within the Spider-Man that I remember of the 60s Spider-Man comics. Whereas it's almost like this is a, an alternate world Spider-Man where there's just subtle things different. Um, did Captain America go fight in Vietnam? Um, I'm pretty sure not. So the biggest shock in here, uh, this is a spoiler. So if, if you don't want it, if you haven't read uh, Spider-Man 1960 and you want to 1960s, then um, then skip ahead till you don't see the Spider-Man anymore. Because at, at the end here, <clears throat> Iron Man is fighting in Vietnam with the troops and Captain America goes over there and chooses to fight uh, with the Viet Cong <laughs> or to fight to save what he may consider innocent villagers from American soldiers. It's not totally clear, but I don't remember anything like that. And um, it's, but it's an interesting concept of Spider-Man trying to decide whether he should go to Vietnam or not. But that's not at all the, I, I thought this would be more focused on the stories as they actually were from the Ditko and Romita era, and then we would get a 70s thing reflecting those. But it, we would age on from that period, but it would start being the same, if you know what I mean. Like there's, a, there's also a scene, again, big spoiler, uh, where Gwen discovers he's Spider-Man. I think the way he handles his conflict with Norman Osborn is completely different here than the way it really, really was in the 60s comics. So it's an odd thing. It's not like wildly divergent from a lot of the basics. Um, <clears throat> the other thing is they say he was 15 in 1962. And then in 1966, they say he's in his last year of college. So that really makes no sense unless he went to college early but that none of his friends would be in college with him yet. Um, so that, that was a confusing detail. I, I think that was just a glitch, a mistake they made. Or maybe I misunderstood something. This might rank even higher if I had liked the art. The art did its job, but I just didn't like it. I don't know. It's like some amalgam of 80s and 90s art styles to me. More 80s, really, but just not in a way that appeals to me. <clears throat> and I, am I misremembering what Mark Bagley's artwork looked like in the past, or has it changed a lot? Um, but the storytelling was good. It was just the art style was I was not a big fan of. So this is turning out to be an odder item than I had thought. I thought it would have more of a nostalgic feel than it does. Okay, so what did I say? That's number eight. <laughs> Let me read count again. Uh, seven, six, five, 
four, three, two, one. Yeah. So this is number seven. Um, not that. Okay. Well, this is obviously a really great cover by Frank Frazetta. It's a reprint of a. I don't know if this was originally a cover on a Warren magazine. This is the Creeps, which imitates Warren magazines. So it's this odd form of nostalgia. Um, and no one story in here was super great, but I just had a lot of fun reading it. Um, and it looks a lot like Warren magazines. Uh, although the stories themselves, I don't know. There, there's something about them. There's a little bit of a taste of um, 70s horror short stories in comics. And a little bit, you know, in color comics, and a little bit of that Warren comics flavor, and a little bit of the EC flavor, but it's not quite any of those. <clears throat> and most stories don't have a lot of depth to them. Like I feel like the Warren stories, and to some extent the EC stories, had quirkier characterization and slightly more layers of characterization to them, even though they were short stories. But anyway, it's highly enjoyable. The most, <coughs> the biggest thing that blows my mind is they have an artist named Benito Gallego who draws almost identical to um, John Buscema. He had two stories in this issue and I think two stories in the previous issue. I would love, I would love Marvel, I would love him to go draw some Marvel characters, do some Captain America or some Avengers or Conan or something and be totally retro John Buscema. I mean, he even inks a bit like John Buscema inked when he was inking his own stuff for a little bit like how Sal Buscema inked John Buscema. Let me see if I can find the other Galago story here. There it is. Second course, the actual cannibalism story in the issue. Um, but look at that. Does, I mean, if you're an old time guy like me, you see John. I'm sure you see some John Buscema in this. It's, it's almost eerie how much it looks like John Buscema. It doesn't look forced. It looks natural. It looks like this is his drawing style. But obviously, um, <coughs> I assume he's got to have based his. It can't just be coincidence that it looks so much like John Buscema. But we have other art styles in here. Um, some that are more reminiscent of of the way old Warren comics look than others. This one, most this one story about the mummy. Uh, it's the most beautiful artwork, and it, it reminds me the most of Warren comics. Anyway, I just had a lot of fun, short, almost silly, sometimes horror stories. Uh, but if if you're in the mood for that, it really works. More on short horror stories coming up. <clears throat> Not in this one. Uh, so this is number six, Stronghold. This is a really interesting kind of creepy comic. It's not just, you know, it's not just like a, another take on Superman or something. And it's not, <clears throat> it's not that much like Nick Fury and S.H.I.E.L.D. It, it's got a lot more of some kind of strange philosophical questions going on here and strange religious stuff uh, more to come like it develops very nicely uh, very disturbingly um, and other than our um, I'm not even sure if the young woman who awakened our our hero who may be a god or maybe a superman like alien or something I don't know if she's going to come back I assume she's eventually going to come back her father appears in this issue but um Oh, wait, here she is. I guess that's her. Um, yeah, so anyway, uh, fun, complicated story. Can't wait to, to watch it continue to develop. So uh, maybe, you know, maybe some of uh, Phil Hester's best work. And I'm, I'm enjoying the Ryan Kelly artwork even more in this issue than the last one. Great coloring, too. <clears throat> um... So at number five, I've got Lucifer. You know, thinking about it now, I'm not sure which was stronger, Stronghold or Lucifer. <coughs> I've been loving Lucifer. 
it feels like this story arc is just about wrapping up. I, I kind of hope it is, and then we move on to another story arc. It, um, I'm not sure why I didn't quite love this issue as much as others. Maybe the, the revelations of the mystery um, are not as good ever as the mystery itself. Um, still lots of, lots of cool stuff, cool artwork. But uh, maybe, maybe it's the focus on a character that you can relate to. There was the, the regular human being who, who got cancer and whose wife had gotten cancer before. But he's, he's a bit of just a, um, he's just enacting the role he needs to enact in this issue and doesn't have as much of a stake in the story anymore. So there's, the story is, has less of a center, maybe. I don't know if he'll be pulled back into the story or if he's sort of played his role and it's over. But the wonderful thing about this is all the layers of story and the interweaving of all the different stories, some of which are very close to myth and others are very gritty and strong, but all eventually come back to Lucifer in some way. So uh, very enjoyable. I don't know. Usually that you would think they would have wrapped up a story on issue six if they plan to do complete arcs and then move on to something else. So I almost worry that this story is going to this storyline has to drag on now to issue 12 or something like that. We'll see. Not a lot new to say about Kaiju Max. I, I really enjoyed this issue. <clears throat> uh, a lot of focus on a giant pregnant robot, which if I when I tried to stop and think about what that really meant, I couldn't. <laughs> Um, it's hard to explain. Here she, here's a picture of her. And her husband is a guard at the, um, at the prison. And I thought all the guards were human, but maybe some of the guards are robots. Um, or some kind of permanently... I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. So that, that, that was the big confusing thing about that. Um, corruption abounds... Uh, tragedy abounds, uh, as it always does in Kaiju Max. Uh, enjoyable issue. We got one more issue left to this season. This season took place at the women's prison, women's the w female monster prison. So um, not really women. So we'll see. Uh, then I think what what is this? Is this season four? It doesn't say here anymore. I think this was season four. So, uh, and I think he has six seasons planned. So we'll see what the next season is. I'm, I'm curious about that. Okay, this is amazing that this Conan is up so high. I'm, with each issue, loving the Conan by Jerry Dugan and Ron Garney. Particularly the Ron Garney art is just, this is a wonderful portrayal of Conan visually. And, and of his world um, and with a distinct strong style uh, I it makes me sad to know that they're only going to do six issues and then some other creative team will take over <clears throat> hopefully the next creative team will do as strong a job as this but the magical world Conan his the, the cross between his pragmatism pragmaticism and his heroic side is balanced out just perfectly here. And uh, so, and, and characters are sketched in well, quickly. Uh, again, what you want with Conan, he passes through the stories of lots of different lives. So, and, and we get to see him through the eyes of other people. So anyway, a very cool issue. I, if you like Conan... I don't particularly recommend Conan the Barbarian so far, but I highly recommend Savage Sword of Conan. And speaking of John Buscema, here is um, Alex Ross uh, doing a painting of some scene drawn by, by John Buscema. In fact, it says here, um, after Buscema and Chan, Ernie Chan must have been the inker on this particular, I think this was like a, a splash page or even a panel from an old uh, John Buscema, Conan comic book, originally. 
Okay, and I finally, up at number two is Edgar Allan Poe's Snifter of Terror, the final issue of it. I finally got a hold of a copy. But this is a, um, <clears throat> for the most part, it's one and done short stories. But there is one of, one of the stories in here, I think was the third and final chapter of some ongoing thing. Uh, this cover is amazing. It's basically Edgar Allan Poe has uh, been painted over in gold and is in the position of that woman in the movie Goldfinger. <laughs> so for some reason, Goldfinger has killed Edgar Allan Poe <clears throat> in this particular issue. Uh, even the the to be the the story that was a continuation was enjoyable, but this story by Mark Russell was amazing. Uh, the tragic tale of Frank and Cherry. He took he took the names and a few details about these old serial characters like Frankenberry and the Toucan Sam, the the Toucan that that liked the Fruit Loops and Captain Crunch, and changed all their names slightly. So it's like Captain Carkle, Captain Crunkle, something like that. There he is, and made a horror story out of it. Um, where they were all being the the mass the evil mastermind behind it all is a guy named General Mills. <laughs> uh, great artwork um, by someone I know from Peter Sendenberg or something. I I can't pronounce his name, but he I believe he's the, he was the artist on a lot of those um, uh, Baltimore comics from Dark Side. Anyway. Great art and coloring. The colorist was, I guess the Peter did his own coloring. So that was an amazing story. And then uh, there was this continuation, Le Duc de Omelette. And it was a bit surreal and, and silly, but I could sort of get into the spirit of it. I guess it was just four pages. So eventually I will hunt down the back issues of this. Now I'm totally convinced that I, I must. And then this uh, William Wilson Incorporated was really cool. They don't explain it. So it's about a future where people clone doubles or really rich people do to help them out with their busy lives so they can sleep with their uh, wife and their mistress at the same time and run their giant corporation. And uh, they don't explain the reference William Wilson Inc. But Will that's the company that makes the clones for these people. But William Wilson was a great story by Edgar Allan Poe about a guy who discovers he has a doppelganger who wherever he goes his doppelganger has been there before him. Um, so this was a lot of fun. I think this was by uh, Milligan. I have to check the credits at the front. Yeah, it was by Peter Milligan with art by Sarah Barini. I never heard of her before but she did a great job. So this was a really fun story. I really liked it a lot. It was weird reading this and reading the the creeps um, because this they both have an air of silliness to them but it's so different that it's such a different take on short horror stories there's something wonderful about horror and how well it works in short stories oh. ah. hope I'm still recording so if not I'm in trouble yeah, and I didn't have time. I'll have to later read the... They even have a crossword puzzle. Read all the, the text pieces. I've read some very good text pieces in other Ahoy comics. And then at the end was a two-page sort of surreal thing about a cat torturing Edgar Allan Poe with this like pit in the pendulum thing of a sneaker that kicks him in the butt. <laughs> and it is a bot by... Um, Hunt Emerson, an underground cartoonist who I don't think I've seen since the early 80s. I haven't run across Hunt Emerson since the early 80s. And that was in black and white comics that I think he self-published. But uh, anyway, that was, that was a wonderful little addition to the whole thing. So Ahoy Comics does it again. This was, this was really good. And finally, my number one pick. Um, but I'd say everything in like the top 12 was good. 
But uh, Brubaker and Phillips finish up their second story. There's the second issue of a two issue story about an ex comic book artist and an old legendary comic book artist that resembles Gil Kane a bit and resembles uh, the person who was in an accident with Alex Raymond. And it definitely had, I don't want to spoil this, but, but it definitely has a clever coming around to think what really happened in certain aspects of the artist's life. I don't know if someone who's just reading this because they like crime stories would get into it if they weren't also into comic book history. I'm not sure. Or maybe this story would get them into the history of, of comic book artists. But, um, yeah, a really... I think Brubaker loves to do stories that kind of circle in on themselves. And it circled back on itself in a really satisfying way. Unlike, for instance... The end of Sparrowhawk that circled back on itself in a way that was more blunt and less subtle. This had a real nice subtle circling back. <clears throat> Although an interesting aspect of it is kind of our narrator must have known the thing that it circles back to at the end all along, I think. Um, but it was a lot of fun seeing Rick, the... Um, one of the, the Rick Lawless, one of the Lawless family that reoccurs a lot in criminal books. And, you know, in a way, he was the most charming character to show up. <clears throat> and so it was nice to see kind of the, I don't know, the romantic side of the criminal in a way. But, um, but he's totally a criminal and has no uh, qualms about being a criminal or anything. Anyway, another great issue. <clears throat> it's amazing that I, I'm enjoying this comic so much that relies so heavily on the narrative boxes. <clears throat> but somehow Brubaker really makes it work, or Phillips makes it work. The two of them together really make it work. And I do feel like uh, uh, Jacob Phillips, the son of the uh, line artist, is kind of improving as a uh, colorist too. Uh, I've enjoyed his color all along, but it keeps getting better. So there you have it. Um, sorry for all the coughing in the middle here. And I don't know um, how incredibly long this is until I press stop and then I'll find out. Talk to you all later.